Hello and welcome to the webinar, The Rise of the Micro-Influencer and the Changing Face of Influencer Marketing and PR. My name is Philip Smith, I'm the Head of News and Content at Gorkana and I'm delighted to welcome you to this, the first Gorkana webinar of 2017. If it's not too late to say Happy New Year in this context, then I'm going to say it, Happy New Year. I may push things with that greeting, but I think it's safe to say influencer marketing is one of the most talked about and exciting areas of marketing and communications at the moment. It's a growth area, judging by the number of agencies and companies offering influencer guidance and solutions. But it's also an area of PR and marketing that is growing up. And according to our two experts who are in the webinar today, as influencer marketing has matured, it has also seen the rise of the micro-influencer. To tell us what a micro-influencer is and what all this means, I'm delighted to say we are joined in the webinar today by Francisco Ashensau, CEO of the influencer platform Use, which is a reach of more than 450 million people globally, and Dora Marota, an Italian who is based in London. She is a personal shopper, a stylist, a fashion editor, and a fashion blogger at DoraFashionSpace.com. Francisco, Dora, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. In the webinar, Francisco and Dora are going to have a look at how some of the brands and PRs have found that working with more smaller influencers can increase mm -hmm. consumer engagement with a brand or a product in a more diverse, genuine, and authentic way. As the larger influencers grow in popularity, working with key micro-influencers ironically offers brands the opportunity to engage their audiences at scale and create a thriving consumer community. In this webinar, we'll find out how they do this and how micro-influencers themselves want to be approached. Before we start, though, let me tell you a little bit more about our guest. Dora, who is a blogger and influencer, has worked in fashion in Italy and Spain. She lives in London after living in Madrid for five years. She worked at Vogue Spain as a fashion assistant and has a master's degree in fashion, communication, and another one in personal shopper at the European Institute of Design in Madrid. She says she also attended the course of fashion media styling at the London College of Fashion in London and says she loves fashion because fashion is all and is in everything. It is art, lightheartedness and depth. It accompanies us in our daily life as in the movies or music, but it is also the right way to communicate who we are. Our other guest, Francisco, is based in Lisbon, Portugal, and describes use as a global network of real people with the power to influence friends, peers and followers. With use through a selection process based on demographic, psychographic, and community-specific data, brands can choose which social influencers best represent them and are the best fit for their campaign or activity. Francisco created Use in 2009, and he's worked as partner, client service director, marketing director, and strategic planning director at Way Marketing Agency. He's also spent time in brand management and trade marketing in FMCG companies, such as Gillette Group and Schweppes. In a few sec seconds, Francisco and Dora are going to kick things off with a short presentation, which they'll run together, and we'll ensure then we've got time for your questions, and we'll make sure there's a question and answer section at the end. So with that in mind, please use the panel on the right-hand side of your screens to send in your questions, and we'll try and get the answers to your influencer questions. So please send your questions in at any stage as we go through the presentation, uh, and we'll make sure that we get them answered at the end of the presentation. I look forward to hearing more what, about what you all want to know about, about influencers and micro-influencers. But before then, Francisco, can I ask you to kick off the presentation? Great, right, Philip. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm here to talk about um, influencer marketing and the rise of new types of influencers. So, influencers are very much a part of almost any company's marketing strategy these days. So far, the current practice has been personal contacts with only a dozen or even two dozens of influencers. And of course, the most obvious ones. So, bloggers or YouTubers with more followers or celebrities have been the most sought by brands. But as celebrities, they do not like their message to be controlled, they make demands, and above all, they want to be paid. So up until now, uh, utilizing influencers within a marketing strategy has been a numbers game. 
so aligning yourself with a person with the largest following to reap results and reach. But really, reach doesn't mean everything today. And there has been a shift in the way that are being used towards strategies that focus more on the qualitative rather than the quantitative aspects of social media influences. So authenticity, deeper storytelling, higher engagement, and the potential of reaching a more tailored audience are shifting brands to a new type of influences. More and more brands are turning to people with a lower number of followers to help them share their messages. And so these are the ones that are called micro-influencers. So it's everyday social media users with fewer than 10,000 followers, to give you a perspective on, on numbers. So what can we see today? There are tens of millions of normal, non-professional influencers uh, that, when stacked together, they have audiences large enough to collective reach, to make a difference in conversations, and trends that are hugely powerful across social media. So identifying influencers outside the A-list ecosystem has been the main challenge for marketers. This part due to the challenge of working simultaneously with a large number of influencers, such as the long tail or magic middle. As it can be hard enough to manage two or three difficult A-listers, Imagine doing that with 100 or even 1,000. However, through platforms such as Use, it is possible to match, manage hundreds or even thousands of influencers at the same time. This is powerful because influencers with a smaller audience have high engagement rates. When you group this together and manage at larger scale, this can be incredibly effective, more effective than working with a few waylisters. We also need to consider changes in the social media algorithms, which are reducing engagement levels. It turns out that once a social media influencer reaches a critical mass of followers, audience engagement actually begins to decrease. And this isn't good for brand campaigns when serious money is being spent. One other aspect is segmentation. So in the field of influencer marketing, segmentation is absolutely crit crucial and critical. It is not enough to segment the influencers by the number of followers, but also by what they represent in terms of characteristics similar to their followers. It's also simple math. For example, if a sportswear company collaborates with a social celebrity with 2 million followers, it can reach a large audience, but maybe 90% of them uh, are not sports fans it would make more sense to activate 100 self-proclaimed athletes whose followers are actually interested in athletics and much more passionate about that interest. So you have several possibilities uh, of targeting. You have audience targeting, demographic targeting, psychographic targeting, and knowing the influences is also one of the major concerns for, of marketers. After all, if you can't connect with them and brief them, how will they work on your campaign? So psychographic segmentation is perhaps the holy grail on, of influencer marketing. This is only possible through tech platforms that function as marketplaces between brands and influencers. Influencers can re register themselves, provide very relevant personal information about their personal situation, their interests, including preference on brands and products, consumption habits, health problems, etc. And this builds an incredible detailed profile on each influencer and ultimately each audience. What about controlling uh, the message? So in the world of influencer marketing, the great discussions of the moment lies in the debate between message control, which assuming it's only possible through, throughout payment, or not control when influencers are not paid in cash to write about the brand or product. Also in this discussion, audience and credibility always pull in different uh, directions. Normally, unpaid influences have higher credibility but a lower reach, and paid influences have higher reach and lower credibility. Depending on your goals, marketers need to decide between short-term sales, sales or building a brand. 
So, how to work effectively with both the long tail and magic middle in a massive way? So the first and most important is to have a platform that works as a marketplace between brands and influencers, where they register and know what they are going for. That's why we have created Use. So Use is an influencer media network where brands can engage with influencers of their target audience. Through Use, brands can test concepts, launch products or services, increase their awareness, receive valuable insights, reach millions of consumers through word of mouth effect, generate sales, and of course create a legion of new brand advocates. And influencer relationship management automation is essential to develop campaigns that evolve experimenting with hundreds if not thousands of influencers, which is all based on deep segmentations that cross audience with similar psychographic profiles. For example, if McDonald's launched new hamburgers for vegetarians and intends to launch a trial campaign with around 1,000 influencers with audiences over 2,000 followers, let's say a potential reach of 2 million, opportunity to see, you cannot do it without using an automation process. It would be a manual nightmare. So until the existence of IRM automation platforms like Use, the selection of influencers was a painful and thankless task that took weeks, if not longer. Hours and hours on Google to look for certain influencers, develop lists, look for contacts, buy lists uh, that often were not qualified, and I'm pretty sure that almost uh, each one of you have done it uh, in the past. And this was an incredible, inefficient use of time. On a platform, the first selection for further targeting is automatic. You can target influencers whose social, demographic, and geographic profiles match the target of the campaign. And they are then invited to respond to qualification service, which will check if they have the appropriate psychographic profile and predisposition to produce content around the product, of course to then share message about the brand with their followers. The specific qualification per campaign has the great advantage of finding influencers suitable for the campaign very quickly, a few days instead of weeks. Crossing your audience with this, qualification data gives you an idea of the estimate's reach and therefore the return on investment. Once the influencers are selected and invited, the campaign really starts. It could be a product trial campaign, it could just be a campaign to share content, it could be an invitation to a launch event, or it could be a research project where the brand wants to obtain opinions, insights, suggestions from the influencers on the best way to improve the product, the image, the communication, or other goals. Either of these possibilities would normally require a Herculean effort of simultaneous communication with the influencers. With, the, with an influencer platform, all changes. Briefings or missions are automatically communicated to all of them. There is, of course, a digital call center system operated by qualified technicians that allows individual questions to be asked by each influencer, but campaigns tend to be self-explanatory. One of the great advantages of automatic marketing campaigns influencer is how the content produced is tracked, replicated, and organized in real time on the client's dashboard. The client can follow daily the content produced in blogs, social networks, or even monitor the personal conversation that the influencers are transmitting through periodic inquiries about the product, level of satisfaction, and likelihood of recommending the product. That's what we call the Net Promoter Score. But it also can measure campaign reach, engagement, for example, likes or retweets, indications of likelihood of acquisition, and return on investment. So now, to give you a perspective on the other part of this equation, let me introduce to you Dora, one of our influencers and an active user. Hello, thank you for the introduction. How I've been saying, I've been working in fashion for quite a lot of years now, and I'm a personal shopper, stylist, and blogger. And I've had various experience from PR and communication to styling and magazine, and the blog has always been a really important part of my work. 
even if I don't blog full time. In fact, I started my blog, Dora Fashion Space, almost six years ago. I've been working in fashion for like more than six years, so basically I started my blog at the beginning of like everything of my journey. I, in fact, after like my master's degree in fashion communication, I felt I needed like a space where I could express myself. Not just because I've always like loved the fashion and I wanted just to give my like point of view and my perspective, but also because I needed like a space where I could like express what I could do. So also to use it as kind of a portfolio in a way. And uh, I've always loved a lot of magazines, so I've thought like about my blog as a, a middle between a magazine and a kind of diary, a fashion kind of diary. So. Um, my blog is about fashion, but like personal shopping style events where I go and kind of beauty and lifestyle. But it's also about kind of everything related to fashion. So it's not just like one or two topics, it's like kind of like more topics like together. And uh, I always like thought about it as a kind of like international space because I'm from Italy, but I live in Spain and I'm based in London. So it's a kind of like a way to put more kind of like a, a different aspect like together. I also show people how fashion could be different in different countries, like give another like perspective. So like in this kind of like six years basically, I've like had the possibility to work with a lot of brands and also to attend a lot like of events. And of course I've had a really like good achievement. Like my blog was awarded between the top 100 like Italian blogs, and this was like really good like you know like point and achievement for me. But I've also had a lot of difficulties in the like the journey. I think like for all the bloggers it's like the same, for like different reasons. Because like blogging, I started in 2011. I was living in Spain at the time, and blogging was quite new. So like no one was really knew how to like relate it to bloggers, how to work with them. And also for me, I wasn't like sure what I like I had to do. Like in, I just started like the idea to create like my magazine, my blog, but I had like no kind of like guide at the beginning. And um, like uh, I think like the the hardest thing was like uh, get the recognition from like uh, brands and like uh, agency and PR. Because like I had like the feeling at the beginning that for some people uh, they really didn't recognize all the kind of work I was putting in the blog. Like I was receiving a lot of, like of emails and like requests for collaboration for brands to work totally for free. So it was at the beginning I did it because I, I didn't really understand the power I could have like with my blog. It was like how much like thoughts I was giving to the brand. But then I started like also like realizing uh, all the work and the hour I had like put in like in my work. So I really also wanted something like you no know, return if I want to just make it as a job like for me. And I think this is like the main point also in the for like in general for bloggers and the main discussion in the bloggers community. The difficulty is to like if you want to just have your blog and just have your blog as a job, live with it also. And uh, because of course it's different for like magazine journalists, they are paid from the magazine paid them to work. But a lot of bloggers are like self-employed, as me, I work as freelancer. So all the time you put like in your blog is your time of life, also like your time of like for work. So you should have some kind of recognition also for it. So this was like the really hard aspect. Another was also let's understand people what I was doing, like where people like asking me, what's your job? And I was saying like I work as a personal shopper and blogger, like nobody understood this. So they were like saying what she's doing, like she's going around shopping or like party all the time. <laughs> and it's not this, it's also like a lot of hard work that you put like there. And then this from like the way, like the difficulty to like in their relationship with people. But another kind of like another point was like the aspect that if I wanted to grow my blog, I had to create a team. Because so it's not just what you do as blogger, but you need like someone that helps you with your website. You need to create a logo. You need like a like kind of web designer to maintain the website. Because there are also some kind of technical difficulties and they could be like, you know, every day. And also you need a photographer. Because like for blogger, like images are, it, it's a bit clever thing. So if you don't have a good photographer there, you can't have a good blog. So it's really important to work like together as a team. And so it is like another kind of point I just like had to, you know, just work on it during these days. 
And at the end, it's basically like create your blog as you would bring your brand. It's basically your brand, you are the brand. So it's all the work that is like with it. And uh, of course, like I, I worked with a lot of brands, but I also worked with PR agency and uh, I worked with platforms like use and other, other also different one. I think like uh, the working with the PR is of course the relationship with PR is everything for a blogger. Is a, as with magazine journalists, you really need to have contact with the PR and with agencies. And some of them are like I have like really good relationship with the PR and agency. Some other, of course, it's more difficult to work with, but I think that, like, in all the sectors, it's basically the same. So, like, I think uh, they, how, like, PR, PR, they always approach me. I receive, like, emails every day from, like, PR agency to work with. And something that really can make for me the difference is when I see that the PR has, like, read, like, written, has, like, read, read my blog. Because if I receive an email that just say, like, uh, like, dear blogger, we love your blog and we want to work with you, it's just like you haven't you know, even, like, opened my blog to see who I am. Because, like, you know, in all the blogs, you have in the blog they bought me and the name. It's not like a big company. You can just look at it and see what my name is. <laughs> so, really, what makes the difference for me is, like, the personalization, that, like, a, Someone really has seen my blog, like it, and write to me to work together. So this is the main point. Because if I see an email like this, I just delete it. <laughs> it's not something I really don't like, you know, to work it with a person who doesn't even have the time to just look at my blog and see who I am. And um, another thing, I think it's also the kind of like uh, the, the kind of like paid or not paid work is a big like argument with like the kind of relation with the PR. I mean, I've done kind of sponsored post review and also kind of free work. It really depends on the project. Because if a PR proposes a project is really interesting, it's something I also I can do it maybe like for free. Of course, not all the time, because I also need to leave basically. <laughs> this is like the point. So it's really, really important to like relationship to build like with. And basically like, a, the way I've like built like my audience in these years, like in these like almost six years. First of all, I tried to understood which like what what kind of audience I had, like which nationality, like like kind of age, and what like what topic could could they be interesting in or not. And then I tried to just read. I tried to read to just write content that can be like good and like it interests people. Also, like kind of using headline, for example, using like good photographs, good images to just engage people, basically, when they read my blog. And then, of course, using kind of CEO rules. They always help work for Google to generate traffic. And then, of course, networking, collaborating also with other brands, with like other bloggers, too. And the a main point to just create and generate like kind of engagement are social media. So, like, social media is like key for like everyone, for brands, for also like for bloggers. And uh, of course, like, uh, the, you think like the game changer was Instagram, because like when Instagram came, it really changed the way bloggers were working. And I think like it's the platform, the best platform to create engagement with the people that follow you on a daily basis, engage with them, answer to their comments, uh, also like kind of like put content and images they can just like and comment. And you, of course, using the right like hashtag, and uh, it's all like all the work like basically together. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Dora, and thank you, Francisco. Um, now, we've got plenty of time for questions, um, and I can see that several have been sent in. But please do take this chance to send in your questions to us and help me put uh, Dora and Francisco on the, on, on the spot, really, about uh, influencer marketing. Um, before we come to your questions, though, I'm going to start, and, and Francisco, if I can ask you, um, we, we've talked about the rise of the micro-influencer, and you've talked about how that can give an opportunity for deeper engagement uh, for certain brands. What, what do you see as a micro-influencer? How do you define them? Um, you know, when is an influencer too big to be a micro-influencer? Or do you have a sort of threshold in mind? Well, yeah. Uh, basically, the, mar the, the market is uh, it's setting the standards for the, the today's uh, types of influencers. So it's very new. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, 
there, there's a, a, a like a target, a 10,000 followers identified for a micro influencer. Of course, this is a number, but it's like a more established rule in the market because we need to uh, know how to address and how to evaluate. The more relevant question here is what the algorithms are doing to um, to influencers and based on the number of followers. So there's lots of t studies that are published that really um, tend to show that the more reach that you have, the less the engagement you can uh, generate. Of course, this relates to uh, quality content, like Dora was saying. You have to get, uh, you have to have the right audience interested in your content. But what we are seeing today is that lower size influencers on reach, of course, that's what I'm saying, are able to generate better engagement today. And it's, it's on Instagram, even on Facebook, it's on YouTube, it's on whatever social media you, you want to call it. So our purpose using this kind of information is how to address to a, a big number of these so-called micro influencers so they all together can be more effective than, than just working with the top of the pyramid. Um, on, on that point, uh, you talked about um, you talked about scale a lot. Uh, do you, do you think there is a threshold also where you can be trying to use too many influencers in a campaign? I'm sure from a technological point of view, you might say it's limitless. Um, you know that's what technology does. But do you have a view on the successful campaigns that are run through your platform where you might say, well, actually if you're trying to contact this number of influencers at once or get them involved in a single campaign, it might be self-defeating, it might be too many. Well, you said it right, it's all about technology. So the difference today is technology enables us to work with a higher number. We have done work for brands uh, working together with 10,000 influencers, for example and we can produce the same effect than working with just 10. So it's not a matter of scale because technology helps us tremendously on keeping the good principles and reaching out uh, in a one-to-one um, -one way. Dora was pointing out that's very important and of course we have to engage conversations uh, most of times by email, of course, but in some cases even using a uh, telephone, for example, if you want to, to pass a particular message. But really technology enables you to reach uh, a higher number, to work uh, with a higher number of influences at the, at, at the same time. So I'm not uh, worried about huge numbers like 50,000 or more because um, that's what technology is here for, to help us to do that. Of course. Um, now, I could see an awful lot of questions that have been sent into us, so um, thank you so much for those. And we will try and get through as many of those as quickly as possible in the next sort of 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, but thank you so much for sending your questions in. And thank you also to those people who said Happy New Year to us as well. Happy New Year to you all. Um, now, I think the first thing is, is actually talking about, um, and there's a lot of questions asking us about, uh, will we make the slides available? Uh, yes, we will make the slides available after the webinar, and uh, we will also have the audio available for the webinar, so you will all get copies of those. Uh, so let me make sure that those happen. Also, um, can I, I, um, there's a question, and this is for Francisco, actually about case studies. Can you share any successful case studies used through the USE platform? Well, yes, we can. not Unfortunately, not today, because due to time uh, constraints. But we will be most welcome if you get in touch with us. We have our uh, contacts in the, in the presentation. And we are most welcome to share you all our available case studies in every sector with different uh, goals and different way to approach. So that's what we do. So we'll be most welcome to receive your, your uh, askings. Great, and yes, if you've asked us a question and you want to get hold of case studies, uh, either ask a question or have sent that in already, we will have your email details and we'll come back to you and make sure that the use team gets in contact. Great. 
Excellent. Now, there is a, um, what's this, a technical question. So this first one, we'll start again. Francisco, we'll come to you. Does Use have influencers above 10,000 reach on its platform? Well, yeah, well, we are discussing here, I mean, uh, we are talking about micro-influencers, and you see micro-influencers in that uh, pyramid um, are in the long tail um, area. Uh, use works both with the long tail and the magic middle. When you're talking about magic middle, you're talking about uh, influencers that have a higher reach, uh, above 10,000, many times uh, 100, 200, 300,000. Uh, so yes, we, we work with, more, with influencers with more than 10,000 reach. We really don't look at the reach as the, the, the main aspect here on the equation. We look at, look at the influencer by uh, its characteristics, their uh, purpose, what he can produce, and really we are um, the link, we believe the perfect link between the brand goals and the influencer goals. So if you want to aim just for reach, of course we can work with uh, influencers with higher reach, but then uh, you are just only producing short-term results. If you want to build a brand more sustainably, then we would advise on looking really on the long tail, on the micro influence, and of course many of the magic middle. So the goals will define uh, what type of influence we will select for you. Okay, great. Now, Dora, can I ask you a question about timing? And this is a question that's been sent in about the relationships with influencers and how they should be built up. So this question says, how far in advance of starting a campaign would you recommend reaching out to build a relationship with an influencer? So in your position, do you get contacted with enough notice? Do people give you enough time to work on a campaign? Or is it very much, we want to do this, can we do this today or tomorrow? I think there are both. Like there are people that just contact you with like advance in time and then there are people that are really like last moment. I think if you could contact at an advance it's always better because he, of course uh, me as all the blogger I plan all the blog posts, the social posts. So the fact like you know it's better if I knew I know like before. If like sometimes even if it's a really last moment, but if it's something I really like I will do it the same, but of course, like you know, like it's better if they contact like before. And if it's if it's someone who hasn't built a relationship with you before, do you find that um, strange? Does that put you off as well? If someone just comes out of the blue, you know, and just says, "Oh, can you work with me today?" sort of thing, or or do you like people to have got involved with you on social media already? No, I mean, it depends, as I was saying, it depends on the project. Like for me, as I work as a freelancer, I'm used to work at last moment. <laughs> and a lot of, like I would just work, also generally in fashion, everything is really like last moment because, uh, you know, like the calendar is always so really busy. So as I was saying, for me, it really depends on the project. And of course, as I was saying before, also the kind of approach people have really changed for me, the, like the, my decision. Okay, great. Now, Francisco, we've got, we got lots of questions about uh, the objectives you've talked about in terms of yeah. brand building and direct sales. This question is, what, what do you think works best in terms of influencing direct sales? So the question is, what do you think gains the best results in terms of influencing direct sales? An influencer with higher reach or a micro-influencer micro with greater engagement? Well, there's not... Um one answer for that question. Of course, it's it's not the same for every brand, for every sector it's in, um, and not one solution fits all. So, what we would advise everyone is, like we do with every kind of project, is we need to get the the right information so we can think and advise you on the best possible strategy. But it will include one or both. Um, of the, um, the areas that you are mentioning. Um, and both of you have obviously consumer backgrounds, um, but this question is about B2B. So Francisco, if I ask you in terms of people using the platform and, and your experience, how is this relevant for B2B products and how can you identify the influences in the corporate or finance sectors? Is that something that's been done with you? Well, yeah, it's of course easier to understand um, the, all of this perspective on B2C, 
uh, if you're talking about cosmetics, shampoos, or drinks, or what kind of area. But when you're talking about B2B, it's really um, as relevant as B2C. Of course, you can find it harder um, to get the right influencers or really looking at their audience. That's one of the things that we are really concerned. Like Dora was saying, she's really concerned on looking at uh, on, 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 on she's audience to see what kind of content it's, it's most related to. So that's one of the things that we look into it. We have experiences with B2B projects, with B2B companies, on banking, on real estate, on insurance, on health, if we call it B2B uh, as well, and, uh, and is um, effective, as much as effective as uh, B2C companies. Because uh, we always trust a recommendation from a friend, from a family member, from an acquaintance, or from someone that we follow online um, on the subjects that we are interested in. Great. We, um, we have a lot of questions about metrics and measurement. Uh, and Dora, I'll start with you, actually, in terms of um, how do you sort of measure your own success? You talked also about you look at your audience. Yeah. and what, what uh, excites them and what interests them. What are the sort of metrics you look for in terms of either measuring engagement with your audience or uh, making sure that you know what they're interested in? Yeah, engagement is really important because, you know, if you write something and you see nobody like is interested in it, just something that put you a little bit off. And for me, it's success when people engage to you, like they send you mail, they ask you information about the product, they ask you information. For example, I receive a lot of mail of people asking me how to be a personal shopper, for example, how did they get into fashion, and people interact like, like in comments. So I think this is like the success for a blogger, that people actually like what you like do, and they read like your blog, they see your social media, and they want like your advice. And, and for Francisco, what, what do you um, do and what do your clients do? The question is, what are the metrics used to measure success with influencers? Well, really, technology enables to, uh, to measure several metrics. And one of the first things that we do with each brand is set up uh, two up to three goals and metrics uh, that can uh, analyze that and define that strategy. So. It's because you cannot reach them all. You cannot. Uh, it's very difficult to drive sales and at the same time build awareness and at the same time, I don't know, uh, get insights and then get engagement and uh, top reach. So it's very hard to work uh, with all of them. One of the, one thing is we can technology enables us to measure it all. So it's just a question of setting the, the right goals and then we can uh, prepare the right strategy uh, for that. Um, we have a question about demographics and uh, the age of audience and the challenge of reaching out to younger audiences. Uh, Dora, can I ask you, first of all, what, what is the sort of typical age of your audience? What is the audience that you're writing for in terms of a demographic? It's like from 25 to 40, like the main audience, and it's uh, like 80% women and then 20 men. Okay. Well, you may be a little, little. Uh, that audience may be a little old for this question, but I, so I'll come to Francisco first with this one. Uh, the question is: When reaching out to younger audiences, say 12 to 16 year olds, who is a bigger influence? Micro influencers on YouTube, etc., directed at them, or more traditional influencing work directed at their parents? Well, it really depends on the area. Uh, I'll give you two examples. So you're t if you're talking about um, Sports, athletics, shoes, and that, those areas. Uh, uh, of course, working directly with a YouTuber uh, that reach those demographics is more effective. If you are talking about brands that really are in the health, nutrition, parenting, worrying about uh, your kids and what they should do really we should target the parents and work with the parents so they can do the influence on, on the other side. So it re it's really about the area and what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Um, now, Dora, we've got loads of questions about fees for influencers okay. and uh, you touched on the payment challenge. I think the first thing is, um, is, is what's happening with fees and I'll read out this whole question. I don't think you'll be able to answer all of it because um, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of detail here, but let's start. 
Uh, we're seeing fees for influencers rise constantly to the point where some are charging more than established celebrities. Do you think that influencers may price themselves out of the market if they continue increasing costs? Or do you think that whilst brands continue to pay the fees, they will continue to rise? Um, so I think the question is, Dora, how do you price things in terms of, um, for instance, if you think it's a really exciting project, does the price fall? Um, and is it something that actually you've seen that there's a more willingness to pay as, as you've developed your career? Yeah, it's actually this is another like big discussion in the blogger community. The problem I think is that everything is really new. So there isn't like there aren't uh, rules. So everybody is just doing what he basically just like wants. So I think it's 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 like at the moment it's kind of tricky for this reason because I know there are people that charge a lot even if they don't have maybe a, a big number of followers maybe they have like more engagement for this reason and there are those people that charge like less than the work they do so it's harder even like for me for like every influencer doing this because it's not you know there are no rules to somebody say I'm just going to just charge these like for me I try to see like how many hours of work I need to put into the project. This is the like the what like the kind of things I just try to follow. And for example, it's a project that just needs a few hours, so it's a project that needs a whole day of work. So for me, I try to just measure the time I put in it, more than everything. Yeah. I see. And actually, uh, before I come to Francisco on that, because I'm I'm really interested in your view on this, Francisco. Mm -hmm. Is is um, there's a question uh, directed at you, Dora, which just says about this payment, what's your attitude towards getting samples or free products rather than a rate? So do you sometimes do what, I guess in old media terms, we'd call the contra, <laughs> you know, send me the samples and maybe I won't need, need payment? Yeah, I do, yeah. I do like kind of sponsored post, I do product review, so they send me the product and they do the article. And they also do collaboration projects that I like. So it doesn't, that, not all the collaboration is to be paid, of course, it depends. So yeah, for me, I accept this. But I know there are some bloggers that uh, even if they receive the product, they want like the payment. I think this depends on every blogger, you know. Okay. Um, Francisco, what, you, you have this sort of helicopter view of all these influencers and all these brands and people. What's your view on all of that in terms of the rising rates? And also, do you think the market will find its own level in terms of rates for influencers? Uh, you, you're one of the few people who's actually, with your slideshow, shown this pyramid of where you think you know, people start getting paid in terms of their influence and so on. What's, what's your view on this whole debate and where, where, where payment is going? Yeah, well, we are making a global study on this, so uh, the findings will be published soon but what can i can say about our experience over the last years well this is all about supply and demand as everything in the world so uh we know for example that 80 percent of all influencers when they start um to becoming uh, or be acknowledged as influencers aim to be paid and to have uh, um, a fee uh, in the future and of course they look at the examples of the those social media stars that get millions for making uh, stupid videos for example <laughs> on YouTube just to point a few and and of course you have the other side on the brands that are still experimenting this area like what Dara was saying it's quite new but there are lots of terrible examples uh, every day and we are seeing brands that are at this stage moving from a paid model to an unpaid model because they have they have had a terrible experience in the past on paying a tremendous amount of money to influencers and the results were uh, zero or almost zero because uh, reach isn't everything uh, engagement like Toro was saying also it's it's key today and maybe it's better to work with someone that has only 1,000 uh, followers but has like 70% engagement, just to give you a number. And it, you, have, you have a high conversion. Then work with someone that has 1 million followers and by the end of the day, it produces zero results for brands. So it's a matter, I believe the market will self-regulate in a couple of years 
our approach to that is and anticipating a few questions that might appear because I see uh, tons of, of it and it's on the on the aspect of paid. If we work um, just non-paid or paid models, um, so we are not. Um, uh, we work with the influences. That's the main thing. Uh, we have to look at each case, uh, each scenario, what the proposition is, and we are the ones that set the, the value and the value could be a really terrific experience on this and we can create just an event and invite just a few people to have a, a phenomenal experience or maybe money could be involved but we will set the rules and of course uh, along with the brands and the influencers yeah. and um, so I would say it's still testing but in a couple of years, it will be a more regulated market, of course. We have uh, rules coming out every day on um, disclosure, what you can do, what you cannot do. Uh, hashtags are, created, are being created every day to regulate this kind of activity. Um, so I believe this is very interesting, uh, and we have two, three years ahead of us that are going to be very interesting in, into uh, in this area. Good, and, and uh, we look forward to hearing your, your thoughts as that develops, and as we said, that the market is maturing, so there are changes. Um, Francisco, I've got some questions that are very directly about you, so I'm going to ask you a whole load of these, but I'm going to ask you for very quick answers, so okay. we can get through as many of them as possible. And then, Dora, I've got a question about um, uh, how influencers like being contacted and, and the relationship that develops there. Um, because I know a lot of people have got interest in that. So first of all, Francisco, how many influencers have signed up to the platform to date, and are they from a variety of sectors or just general lifestyle? So uh, this is a global platform. We have more than 400,000 active users registered, and, uh, and I say active because we have uh, profiles on that. It's not just signing in and getting an account. We don't consider that because we really, really need to, to understand uh, each person. Uh, in UK, because we are here in UK, we have more than 19,000. Uh, it's one of our markets to really build and one of the most interesting areas. But of course, influence is a global scenario because it's more not just a territori territorial um, uh, thing, it's more a, a language thing. You know, uh, for example, if you speak English, you uh, you are not just going to influence people who live in the UK, but uh, you will you will influence the whole world. And we look at the Spanish language, the Portuguese language, the French language, and we we are seeing a great phenomenon that people who are living in US that are influencing Europe and uh, Asia, for example, or some uh, some girl that is a fashion edit and she lives in Madrid and she is Spanish and she can influence all Latin America, for example. So it's quite interesting to, to, to look at this. So it seems that they aren't the limits that we would traditionally think of in media, that things have changed. Um, I, I hate to think how influential Dora must be with her Italian, Spanish and English background. So uh, um, now the, the question, you've answered a question actually there about uh, the number of UK influencers, because someone's got a question from a very UK perspective, so I won't need to ask that now. Someone else has asked, uh, does you have a website in English? I'm sure it does, because I've read your website in English. We will make sure you get the right link. Uh, someone's saying that they've only read a Portuguese website. Now, um, this is a question um, about the relationship with influencers for you, Dora. So th this question is, um, it says, really useful influencers are obviously busy. So how regularly do you want the brand to keep in contact with you? If it's a long-term partnership rather than just for a specific projects. So do you get annoyed by brands getting in touch so often? Or do you like them being in touch every every so often? How, how often should they be in touch with an influencer? No, like I like like brands to be in touch with me when they have like news, if they have for example in fashion, like new collection or some news coming up events. I like like reading about like you know, like them with what's going on. I think like uh, it's good to be in contact when you have something relevant for the blogger influencer. 
because uh, like being touched with sending like lots of newsletters about maybe topics that are not even relevant to what you do, it's just a waste of time for everybody. So if you are in touch with when for with the topics, events, or, or every news that is like relevant to the influencer, that's like a good thing. Great, thank you. Now uh, we are running out of time, but we're going to try and get through two or three more questions. Uh, it will depend on, uh, I guess, the length of the questions. So I'll try choose some short ones here. But thank you everyone for sending in these questions, and we will make sure that all of you have asked for more information that we can get back in touch with you. Now, um, Francisco, this is a question about, um, I think it's about the key metrics of success again, but this is a bit different about sort of monitoring and, and ensuring that results are in the right place. The question is, if reach is not the key, which is congratulatory on your side, what is the actions um, made in place, so I assume what are the actions to be put in place to ensure results from an influencer uh, while keeping its opinions true and honest regarding the brand. So I guess, and I would obviously point out that, that Gorkana and Cision have loads of ways of, of monitoring um, this sort of um, response. But in terms of your experience, Francisco, how, how do people ensure that, uh, I think it's the influencer remains on message, really, is, is, is the question. I, I, I don't seem to understand right to the, the question. Sorry. Can do, you, do you sort of, um, apart from, if reach isn't the only metric, uh, one of the things is that you need to ensure that the influencer is sort of s saying the same message that you want them to say. How is that monitored in your experience? Is that something that uh, brands can monitor through use, or is that something that um, you, you recommend a different approach? Well, um, uh, brands can monitor everything through use. Okay, so uh, our platform enables, uh, enables brands to follow everything that is being produced. So of course, content is really the, the 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 aspect here, and we're discussing about paid, non-paid uh, brands who paid influence, who pay influencers n normal normally want to get control of the message, and that's I'm sorry, but that's not possible to happen. So our role here as a, an intermediary in the in this equation is really to manage expectations from both sides and making things relevant for both sides and really getting the success on, if not reach, the other goals. If it's content produced, if it's sales, wherever uh, the concern is. Um, we've got another question about micro-influencers and the scale of micro-influencers. And this is um, quite an interesting one, particularly in mind of what you've just said about language. So um, this question is about, is population a factor? In Ireland, a local micro-influencer might have 1,500 followers. Population is relative, is in Ireland the population is 4.6 million people. So uh, is that another factor that you bear in mind? Well, yes. If you look at the territorial aspect, really it's traditionally harder to have higher influences in Ireland than uh, in UK. And that, and, and comparing that with the U.S., it's even harder. So, um, but we are now looking at more global aspects. We have influences that were born in, I don't know, in the most uh, uh, far country in the world that have millions and millions of followers. So, the barriers are not there anymore. We are in a global world with social media. And I would say an influencer in Ireland has the same ability than an influencer in in US, for example. Of course, of course. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so let's try and get through another couple of um, uh, questions. Uh, we've got quite a few from from charities, and also rather about charities in the charitable sector. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, uh, Francisco, a question about. Um, What's suitable for fundraising? This one is actually no. Sorry, this is uh, that's exactly the opposite. Non-fundraising charity campaigns. So this question is: Is this suitable for non-fundraising charity campaigns, i.e., campaigns aimed at awareness raising and behaviour change? You have talked about brand building, so I'm, I'm I'm suggesting this might not be different from that. No, it's yeah, it, it's it's the same thing. So uh, we have done projects on social uh, areas, 
um, from our part of our brands and we can really change behaviors because the best way to change uh, some person's behavior is being influenced, influenced by someone he trusts, like a friend, family or someone he follows. So we just have to work on the right message and the content to produce the same effect. So it's suitable for, for those areas as well. So um, you're saying, and I, I, I say this because there's another question about saying are, are the sort of metrics for charities or NGOs, are they different for a commercial brand? It sounds like you're saying, no, they're not, actually. You look at it in the same They are not. It's about conversion. It's about engagement. It's about um, fundraising, if you want, at the end of the day. Um, we have done social projects for... Uh, um, several foundations uh, like Make-A-Wish for example and we've seen great results on our influencers um, engagement and their followers as well for example. Okay great. Um, we're going to finish in a second so um, I'm going to ask uh, one last question and I think that question actually is I'm going to say both of you. you you've talked about a lot of issues and, and Dora we'll start with you on this but uh, let's talk covered a lot of ground, talked about a lot of issues. What's the one thing you would say to the audience listening on this webinar that they should keep in mind when they're dealing with micro-influencers? What's the one thing you would say, don't make this mistake, or this is the one thing you should always do when dealing with a micro-influencer? As I was saying before, it's just like send messages relevant to who you are like contacting to. It is like the key point. So make sure it's relevant, yeah. personalized, you yeah. said, and a few questions have asked about that, so yes. Absolutely, make sure it's personalized. Um, Francisco, is your sort of final words on this? What's the one thing you would leave the audience with uh, as, as a key to success with micro-influencers? Well, it's a very commercial message uh, because it's really, uh, like I said before, for brands don't have the resources normally to work directly with um, the so-called micro-influencers because they only see results if they work with a, a higher number at the same time so I will say uh, let us help us let us help you do that and um, because we believe and Dora is the best person here to say that if she feels like uh, we know she does if she feels that we are relevant uh, use is relevant uh, to her uh, we think we are relevant to all the other uh, influencers and users that work with us so we can help the brands um, get into a different uh, stage on this relationship. Excellent. Thank you. And I'm so sorry. One of the worst parts of my job is that I always have to cut things short, uh, but I'm afraid we're running out of time and I'm very aware that uh, we're coming up to the hour mark. So that's all we've got time for today, I'm afraid, but thank you so much for listening in, joining in the webinar and for all of your questions. Uh, and we will make sure that we come back to you with, with the slides. And for those of you who've requested further information, um, we've got your emails and we will come back in contact with you and someone from the use team or, or someone from Gulkana will be in touch with the relevant information. I want to finish by thanking Francisco and Dora for all their answers to all those questions uh, and for their presentations and giving us insight for both from both sides of the micro-influencer fence. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the webinar. Keep your eyes peeled on gulkana.com for the next in our webinar series. Uh, and thank you to everyone again who's been able to join us. And I hope you'll join us again soon. The webinar is now over.